Good evening, welcome to This Week in Turkey. The tension between Turkey and Germany continues as President Erdogan accuses Germany of being reminiscent of the Nazi period. This week, the mounting tension between Turkey and Germany hit a new high. Following the arrest of the derailed correspondent Deniz Yücel and the cancellation of the referendum campaign rallies of Turkish Justice Minister Bekir Bozda and Turkish Economy Minister Nihat Zeybekçi, President Erdogan accused Germany on Sunday of fascist actions reminiscent of Nazi times. The cancelled rallies aimed at gaining the support of the 1.5 million Turkish citizens in Germany. Germany, you have no relation whatsoever to democracy and you should know that your current actions are no different to those of the Nazi period, Erdogan said at a rally in Istanbul. Against Erdogan's words, German politicians reacted with shock and anger. German Justice Minister Heiko Maas told reporters that Erdogan's comments were absurd, disgraceful and outlandish. But he cautioned against banning Erdogan from visiting Germany or breaking off diplomatic ties, saying that such moves would push Ankara straight into the arms of Putin, which no one wants. The deputy leader of the German Christian Democratic Union Party said the Turkish president was reacting like a willful child that cannot have his way, while Andreas Schuer, a top leader of the Christian Social Union in Bavaria party, described Erdogan as the despot of Bosphorus and demanded an apology. In response to German politicians, Erdogan didn't ease off his tone. He said he could travel to Germany himself to gain support for the constitutional change. Furthermore, the leader of the Nationalist Opposition Party, Devlet Bahçeli, also declared that he would accompany Erdogan if he would go to Germany. If I want to come to Germany, I will, and if you don't let me in through your doors, if you don't let me speak, then I will make the world rise to its feet, Erdogan told in a rally. Besides Germany, other European politicians also entered the fray. Austrian Chancellor Christian Kern called for an EU-wide ban on campaign appearances by Turkish politicians. Moreover, Dutch nationalist Gerd Wilders said on Sunday that he would declare the whole cabinet of Turkey persona non grata and described Erdogan an Islamofascist. On Wednesday, Foreign ministers of Germany and Turkey held a meeting to discuss the ongoing tension between the two countries. German Foreign Minister Sigmar Gabriel's breakfast meeting with the Turkish counterpart came just a day after the Turkish Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu held a speech in the Turkish consulate of Hamburg, where he accused Germany of systematic antagonism against Turkey. After the meeting, Gabriel told the reporters that Good relations are important because things are so tense now. Returning to normality is what my Turkish colleague and I want, he said. However, Gabriel also made it clear that there are lines that should not be crossed and one of those is the comparison with Nazi Germany. Yesterday, German Chancellor Angela Merkel also commented on Erdogan's accusations of Nazi practices. In her strongest comments so far about Erdogan's statement, she said, We will not allow the victims of Nazis to be trivialized. These comparisons with the Nazis must stop. After vowing that the German government would work to ensure that Yücel is released, concerning the possibility of breaking off contact with Turkey, Merkel said, We want to live with our basic values as we think fit. The latest repercussions of the ongoing tension between Turkey and Europe came from Switzerland and the Netherlands. Zurich authorities have appealed to the Swiss government requesting to cancel the Turkish foreign minister's visit for security reasons. And lastly, a planned rally in Rotterdam due to be attended by Turkey's foreign minister has also been cancelled, the Dutch city's mayor said on Wednesday. Our guest via Skype tonight is Professor Kerem Ökdem. 
He is a professor of Southeast European Studies and Modern Turkey at the University of Graz and also a research associate at the Center for International Studies at the University of Oxford. Uh, good evening, Professor Oktam. Welcome. Can you hear me? Hello, good evening. Yes, very well. Uh, Professor Oktam, I'd like to start by asking you about uh, a court ruling that came from Germany's constitutional court today. So according to this issued ruling, uh, the foreign leaders politicians from different countries don't have the right to hold political rallies in Germany. This comes at a time when rallies by two Turkish ministers were cancelled due to other reasons, or namely security reasons. So what do you think about this decision, or to be more precise, what do you think about the timing of this decision? How should we read this? Well, the court ruling uh, came because of a claim, uh, of, of a complaint from a member of the public. So the court was uh, responding to a complaint uh, which basically uh, complained that um, uh, the German government allowed Turkish ministers to speak uh, for the referendum campaign in Germany and thereby uh, um, violated the German constitution. And uh, the court had to rule on that, had to rule on that immediately. It basically said, um, well, uh, uh, foreign politicians don't have the right to hold election campaigns in Germany. There is no right coming from the German constitution or in fact from international law, but they still rejected that particular comp complaint in saying, in saying that uh, uh, the German con constitution was not violated. So the reason why uh, this uh, decision comes now is because it was uh, an immediate decision, an immediate reaction to that particular complaint. But it's also interesting because it's, it's, it's particularly judicious. It's kind of uh, uh, speaking to both sides. It says, well, foreign uh, politicians don't have a right, but it doesn't mean that they're not allowed to speak in Germany. Um, so it's, a, in a way, kind of a very balanced decision. But of course, we have to see in, in the context of uh, a number of uh, um, uh, uh, politicians being uh, turned down, being not allowed to hold election rallies, and of course this is a major issue for you know the German government, for a number of uh, 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 European countries. In fact, not only in Germany but in Austria and Switzerland, mm -hmm. we have exactly the same uh, the same issue. And in all of these countries, there is a deep fear that um, you know the, the referendum campaign might actually carry the polarization of Turkey's political landscape into the uh, Turkish communities in Germany and Austria and Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Professor Oktam, just like you mentioned in your response, Germany isn't the only country whose relations are currently deteriorating um, with Turkey at the moment. We've seen similar crises over, over the cancellation of election rallies in, in the Netherlands. So, um, and, and also on in, in Austria. So what's your take on Turkey's current relations with other EU member countries? Well, I mean, the, overall Turkey's image, of course, in Europe has taken uh, a blow after blow after blow. I mean, obviously starting uh, with the attempted coup attempt in July mm -hmm. 2016, but, uh, you know, ever since th things have just been very, very problematic. It's not only the election rallies. I mean, think of the fact that, you know, a growing number of Turkish diplomats, you know, acting diplomats are actually asking for asylum. Uh, there are more than 130 cases in uh, Germany now, and there are several cases in Switzerland where, you know, Turkish diplomats have asked for asylum because they are afraid that, you know, they might uh, face uh, uh, unlawful um, uh, courts in, uh, in Turkey. There is a recent... Uh, um, report by the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe which says that the referendum is highly problematic, that it might lead to a one-person regime. Just today uh, a report of the United Nations came out which uh, accused Turkey of massive human uh, rights abuses in South East Turkey. So you see that like um, the bad news about Turkey and quite, quite condemning news about Turkey are piling up and of course, um, there is a, a lot of frustration in a number of uh, uh, European capitals about uh, the, the kind of rather erratic uh, developments um, which Turkey has been uh, taking in the last few months, uh, one should say. And one of the reasons actually why there still hasn't 
much of a response from the European Union so far is that the European Union is very much um, uh, busy with its own uh, problems. I mean, today there was a, a meeting, a, a summit in Brussels, and you know, it was the last summit which would be attended by Theresa May, uh, the British Prime Minister, before Brexit starts. And there were major kind of uh, conflicts between Poland and uh, the European Union. So you see, like, there's a lot, lot of conflicts happening in, in the European Union at the moment, which basically uh, keeps the from focusing on Turkey, otherwise I think uh, reactions would probably have been much more severe. Mm -hmm. So up to this point we've talked about uh, the governments in the EU and their relations with Turkey, but let's now turn to the rise of uh, the far-right parties in, in European countries. There are elections coming up in France and, and the Netherlands. So just in general, what's your opinion on, on the rise of the far right in Turkey and how is this expected to affect the European countries' relations with Turkey? The rise of the far right is of course a big uh, um, Europe-wide phenomenon, um, particularly in, in, in you've, you've mentioned already, uh, the Netherlands and France, Austria, uh, large parts of Eastern Europe but also in Scandinavia. Um, these far right parties are probably distinguished by their uh, dislike or even hatred of Islam, of migration, and thereby also, in most cases, um, because of their um, dislike of Turks. So um, that obviously kind of very much complicates the picture because until now, such uh, let's say extremist uh, uh, um, uh, opposition to Turkey or such extreme views about Islam were very much limited to. Well, actually, they were never uh, present so far uh, um, present in governments. But you know, if they are uh, uh, um, elected, that could change. Uh, it seems less likely in the Netherlands, but maybe in France, you know, <laughs> it's unlikely it's still. But if Marine Le Pen became uh, president in France, that would have a major negative impact uh, on the future of Turkey and on Turkish European relations, because so far, even though there is a lot of, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of rhetoric, but overall, the European Union does, of course, want it to, um, you know, to, to continue as it is, uh, not to fail as a country because it's dependent on it. It's dependent on uh, Turkey holding back refugees. It needs Turkey as a buffer zone. It needs Turkey for its own security. But for the extreme right, you know, none of these are important issues, the extreme right wouldn't even care if Turkey exploded. So uh, there is a serious risk coming from the extreme right, but I don't think that we are uh, standing in front of a European revolution where uh, the extreme right and the extreme populists will take over um, key European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for your comments, Professor Oktam, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now moving on with our next video. A session titled Human Rights and the Political Situation in Turkey was held at the UK Parliament yesterday. Turkish journalist Ushan Elicin from London has summarized the British government's response to the session for Medioscope. The British government emphasized that Turkey is a vital strategic partner. They say, Turkey is an important partner who is fighting against the problems in the region. We are working together and this is very important to us, especially in terms of the fight against ISIS. They also underlined that they are working in cooperation with Turkey on Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan and Somalia. Moreover, it was emphasized that Turkey is still a solution partner for the Cyprus problem. Turkey's importance as a trade partner was another point made by the British government, who additionally underlined that nearly 2 million British tourists visit Turkey every year. They are very proud of the visit Theresa May paid to Turkey in January. The government agrees with the MPs' concerns about the ongoing violations of human rights in Turkey and the special measures taken after the July 15th coup attack. However, they also make it clear that they should be taken into consideration with empathy. They say, Turkey has gone through a very difficult period. 
The fact that the Turkish people have taken it to the streets have shown that they are sided with democracy. Yes, Turkey may have crossed some lines. There are violations of rights and we have made our warnings. But Turkey is a very important trade partner for us. We have a trade volume of 16 million pounds and we are determined to increase this to 20 million pounds. Of course, these words caused some disappointment for those who organized this session and they thought, how can you prioritize trade and not pay enough attention to issues like democracy and human rights? A civilian helicopter owned by a private firm crashed in the Büyük Çekmece district of Istanbul this morning, killing five people on board, including four Russian citizens. A civilian helicopter belonging to a private company crashed in the Büyük Çekmece district of Istanbul on Friday morning, killing five people on board, Istanbul Governor Vasip Şahin has stated. Seven people are reported to have been on board at the time of the crash. The Skorsky S-76 model helicopter hit a TV tower in the district under foggy weather conditions before crashing onto a nearby highway, according to an eyewitness who spoke to private broadcaster CNN Turk. The cause of the accident is unknown, Shahin said, adding that an investigation into the crash was underway. The helicopter was carrying a Zajibashi building products country director CEO Salim Özen and four Russian guests along with the two Turkish pilots. One manager and four Russian guests were on board, Bülent Eczacıbaşı, head of Eczacıbaşı Holding, told reporters. The helicopter took off from Atatürk airport at 11.16 am and crashed five minutes later, which was heading to the Bozuyuk district of the northwestern province of Anatolia to bring the passengers to a facility belonging to the group there. A number of ambulances and firefighters were immediately dispatched to the scene. The battle for Mambij city continues in northern Syria. The ongoing battle against ISIS in northern Syria pits Ankara against Washington at Mambij. Recent developments show that Ankara is dissatisfied about Washington's Raqqa plan, which is based on the involvement of Syrian Kurdish forces in the intended operation. Membij city is currently held by the Membij Military Council, which is established by the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces last summer to protect the city and to expel ISIS. Last week, Foreign Minister Mevlüt Çavuşoğlu stated that Turkey would strike if Syrian Kurds do not withdraw from Manbij. Now ISIS is confronting an array of enemies approaching Raqqa, but these are divided with competing agendas and ambitions. The Syrian Democratic Forces, whose main fighting force is the Syrian Kurdish Popular Mobilization Units, backed by the US-led Air Coalition, are now getting close to Raqqa. The Turkish priority in Syria is to contain and, where possible, to reduce or eliminate the power of the Syrian Kurds, whom Ankara sees as an extension of the Kurdish insurrection in Turkey. However, the US is decisive to pursue the intended Iraq cooperation by cooperating with the PYD. The recent leaked Pentagon plan for the coming assault on Raqqa calls for significant US military participation including increased special operation forces, attack helicopters and artillery, and armed supplies to the main Syrian Kurdish and Arab fighting forces on the ground, according to US officials. However, this plan was not well received by Turkish authorities. Turkish Prime Minister Yıldırım said on Tuesday, it was unfortunate that some of Turkey's allies had chosen the Syrian Kurdish YPG Militia as a partner in the fight against the Islamic State in Syria. Following the recent developments, the general staff of Turkey, the United States and Russia have come together in Turkey in a first-of-its-kind tripartite summit to discuss how to avoid an unintended confrontation as forces from all three nations operate on an increasingly crowded battlefield in Syria. The main purpose of the meeting was to discuss the importance of additional measures to deconflicting operations, a spokesman for General Dunford said in a statement after the meeting. Gönül Tol, the founding director of the Washington-based Middle East Institute Center for Turkish Studies, 
commented on the ongoing tensions between Turkey and the Kurdish forces for media. The most important development in Syria is of course the fact that the Syrian democratic forces have handed over Western Mambish to the regime forces. And it's also important that it is carried into effect upon the agreement made with Russia. In this show we have talked many times about this. We have talked about boundaries of the cooperation between Turkey and Russia in Syria. It means that Russia and Turkey can take joint action to a certain extent. Russia can tolerate Turkey's military intervention in Syria to a certain extent. Now, in Mambish, American, Russian and regime flags are flying. It shows that neither Americans nor Russians are ready for giving up Kurds. Kurds came to where they stand now by using these two forces against each other. For example, Mambi Military Council made a statement and said that they left a few villages to the regime's control in order to defend themselves against Turkey and the forces that Turkey support. The UN Human Rights Office published a report today on the human rights violations committed during the Turkish government's security operations in southeastern Turkey in the last two years. The report claims that these violations have affected more than 30 towns and neighborhoods and displaced between 355,000 and half a million people, mostly of Kurdish origin. The report describes the extent of the destruction in the town of Nusaybin in Mardin province, where 1,786 buildings appear to have been destroyed or damaged and the Sur district of Diyarbakir, where the local government estimates that 70% of the buildings in the eastern part of the district were systematically destroyed by shelling. The UN Human Rights Office is particularly alarmed about the results of satellite imagery analysis, which indicate an enormous scale of destruction of the housing stock by heavy weaponry, the report states. The report also claims that in the town of Gizre in Shirnak province, in early 2016, up to 189 men, women and children were trapped for weeks in basements without water, food, medical attention and power before being killed by fire induced by shelling. The report also cited information received from the government of Turkey indicating that the Kurdish Workers' Party, the PKK, which the government considers a terrorist organization, had conducted a number of violent attacks that caused deaths and injuries among Turkish security forces and other individuals. The report also documents accounts of torture and forced disappearances, incitement to hatred, prevention of access to emergency medical care, food, water and livelihoods, and violence against women. I'm particularly concerned by reports that no credible investigation has been conducted into hundreds of alleged unlawful killings, including women and children, over a period of 13 months between the late July 2015 and the end of August of 2016, the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, Zaid, said. Professor Yalçın Karatepe from Ankara University has evaluated the current performance of the Turkish economy for Medioscope this week. Karatepe argues that the government's focus is on the upcoming constitutional referendum and not on generating long-term solutions. When we look at the government's statements, we understand that all economic decisions are related to the April 16th referendum. For example, there is a significant cut in the special consumption tax until the end of April. Why is it only until the end of the April? We all know that this is related to the referendum. We were talking about the restructuring of debts, installments or tax liabilities and debts to public institutions are rescheduled for May. All debts are rescheduled for May. The government is trying to influence the result of the referendum. The economic measures do not intend to solve long-term problems of the Turkish economy. All these measures intend to affect the voters' decision in the April referendum. The economy of a country should be something much more complicated with long-term consequences. As an economist, 
I do not approve that the economic policies pursued by the government, which solely aim to determine the result of the referendum. But the citizens are aware of this. They do not take their information only from pro-government media outlets. When the government announces that there will be huge tax cuts, people understand why this is being done. The 15th feminist night walk took place in the Beyoğlu district of Istanbul on International Women's Day. The crowd chanted support for the international women's strike and condemned violence against women. On Wednesday evening, the Istiklal Avenue in Istanbul witnessed one of the most crowded demonstrations in the recent years. The avenue was filled with slogans, banners, with different messages, dances and chants. Despite a heavy police presence and water cannon trucks on standby, the Istanbul march took place peacefully. Meanwhile, in Ankara and Kocaeli, police intervened to do night march by using gas. Four women in Ankara and 74 women in Kocaeli were detained. Women have gathered in front of the French Cultural Center in Istanbul for the 15th feminist night march. The march ended at Tunnel Sukair after a two kilometers walk. Over 10,000 people, mostly women, walked along the Istiklal Avenue chanting and male perpetrated violence. A deep shade of purple dominated the colorful crowds in Istanbul who marched holding placards saying women are free and we are strong united. A press statement in Turkish and Kurdish held a tunnel scare. The women from the Turkish metal union workers who lost their lives in a bus accident while driving to Ankara to attend International Women's Day activities were commemorated and their names were read out. Another woman who was killed by her ex-husband on March 8 was also commemorated. Women condemned the attack on a group of female students at Big University who were organizing a March 8 gathering on the central campus. Feminist night march demonstrators were holding banners with slogans in Kurdish, Armenian, Greek and English. They were chanting mostly a slogan in Kurdish, Jin Jian Azadi, which means woman, life, freedom. And they referred to referendum which will take place on April 16th. The women also protested the government and the president Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The press statement ended with the words, we will not leave the streets and the nights. The trials of the participants of the editor-in-chief on Watch campaign held by the pro-Kurdish daily newspaper Özgür Gündem continued this week. Last year, pro-Kurdish and leftist daily Özgür Gündem had launched an editor-in-chief on Watch campaign due to the increasing repressive measures against the newspaper and its employees. The campaign, which ended on August 7th, was joined by a total of 56 people. On August 16th, Özgür Gündem was closed down with the charge of terrorist propaganda. Fifty of the attendees of the editor-in-chief campaign, who fulfilled the duties of the editor-in-chief for one day to show solidarity with the newspaper, also faced prosecution. Files of 38 people have been turned into legal cases. Among the prosecuted are various well-known writers, journalists and human rights activists. On March 7th, Five participants of the newspaper's editor-in-chief on watch appeared before a judge. Journalists, writers and actresses who wanted to show solidarity with the newspaper were tried on the grounds of terrorist organization propaganda and releasing or publishing terrorist organization statements or declarations in accordance with the Anti-Terrorism Act. The court gave the prosecuted varying monetary and prison sentences. But these sentences are deferred for the moment. In the court, Journalist Hasan Jamal made the following statement. I'm here to defend the free and independent media and to stand up to say that journalism is not a crime. In this sense, I'm here to defend also the freedom of Kurdish journalists. And while I do that, I have to emphasize that in an environment in which Kurdish journalists are not free, Turkish journalists can neither be free. On March 9th, the trials of the participants of the editor-in-chief campaign continued. This time, trials of the other five participants ended with the court ruling a fine of 20,000 Turkish liras and 30 months in prison in total. These sentences were also deferred. Now let's hear what's on in Istanbul this weekend. The Monation Festival.
festival has been a staple of Istanbul's in the music scene for the past seven years. The festival is known for its creation of talented artists rather than what has been defined as in the sounds in the music industry. The festival took place this January, but the second day was delayed due to weather conditions. The long-awaited ending to this year's festival will take place at Babylon this Saturday. The International Women's Day may be over this year, but Filmore is still highlighting movies made by women with its traditional International Filmore Women's Film Festival on wheels. The festival is celebrating its 15th birthday this year, and Istanbul screenings are taking place in the French Cultural Center at Taksim. After last year's breathtaking performance, Roman Fulugel is visiting Istanbul again. Fulugel is known for his delicate passages in between IDM, Electro House and Techno. You can lose yourself in the major beats of Fulugel at Garage Istanbul this Saturday. That's all from this week in Turkey. Thanks for tuning in. Hope to see you again next week at 9 p.m. Bye.